This lecture covers Punnett squares. Support for the development of this lesson has been provided by the National Science Foundation through the Ohio University Boat of Knowledge and the Science Classroom Program. We'll start with an activity. Write down your eye color. Now write down the color of your parents, siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins, and grandparents' eyes. Think of 10 people you know that aren't related to you and write down their eye color too in a separate column. Share your lists with the class. Which eye color is most common? Do you think the same eye color will be the most common everywhere? Look at your family list. Who has the same eye color as you? Why do you think you got your eye color and not a different one? Do your siblings have the same eye color or different than you? What are other characteristics that you and your family members have in common, like hair color and type, height and skin color? Why do you think some characteristics are more common than others? How are these characteristics inherited? We can use something called a Punnett square to explain why you have the eye color or other characteristics that you do. Punnett squares were devised by a British geneticist named Reginald Crundall Punnett. Punnett squares can be used to determine the probability of offspring having a certain genotype. Great, but what's a genotype? Let's go through some terms before we get too far into the Punnett squares discussion. Genotypes are an organism's hereditary information. Phenotypes are the organism's actual observed features. An allele is the sequence of a gene. We can say an organism is heterozygous if its cells contain two different alleles, and homozygous if its cells contain the same allele. It's easy to remember the difference between genotype and phenotype if we remember that genotypes are for genetics and phenotypes are for physical features. So how would we use all these terms we just learned to describe an organism's traits? Let's go back to eye color as an example. My grandma has blue eyes and my grandpa has brown eyes. That means my father's genotype, his hereditary information, includes both brown and blue alleles. My father has brown eyes, therefore his phenotype, his actual observed feature, is brown eyes. Seems pretty confusing, right? That's where Punnett squares come in handy. Before we can use the Punnett square, we have to write the parent's genotypes. A genotype is represented by two letters, and each letter represents an allele. The letters may be capital or lowercase, depending on whether an allele is dominant or recessive. Capital letters denote a dominant allele, and lowercase letters denote a recessive allele. For the eye color example, brown is dominant and blue is recessive. Let's use the letter B to represent the alleles. Should the brown allele be capital or lowercase? Since brown is dominant, we will use a capital B for the brown allele and a lowercase b for the blue allele. If an organism has at least one dominant allele, then their physical features, their phenotype, will portray the dominant trait. Remember that genotypes can be heterozygous, with one dominant and one recessive, or homozygous, with both dominant or both recessive. Let's see if we can figure out the genotypes for grandma and grandpa in our example. Remember that grandma has blue eyes. What two letters should we use for the alleles in her genotype? Will her genotype be heterozygous or homozygous? Think about these questions and discuss what you think grandma's genotype should be. Grandma's genotype will be two lowercase b's. Since she has blue eyes, which are recessive, she can't have any brown alleles, so both of her alleles must be lowercase b. Since both alleles are the same, her genotype is homozygous. Now try to answer the same questions for Grandpa. Remember that his eyes are brown. What two letters should we use for the alleles in his genotype? And will it be heterozygous or homozygous? Since Grandpa has brown eyes, which are dominant, 
we know he must have at least one dominant allele, which we represent with the capital B. If you said Grandpa's genotype is capital B, capital B, then you are correct. But if you said Grandpa's genotype is capital B, lowercase b, you are also correct. Either of these genotypes represents brown eyes, so Grandpa's genotype could be either homozygous or heterozygous. Now that we know the possible genotypes for Grandma and Grandpa, we can use Punnett's square to find out the possible genotypes for Father. Punnett squares are set up a lot like multiplication tables. First, we draw a square and split it into four smaller squares. Then, we write the genotype for one parent along the side, and the genotype for the other parent along the top. We'll start by using the genotype capital B, lowercase b, for Grandpa. Now we can fill in the small boxes. Let's start with the box in the top left corner. The alleles that go with this box are the capital B from Grandpa and the lowercase b from Grandma. We put these two alleles together to get the genotype for this first box, which we'll write as capital B, lowercase b. If we go to the box in the top right corner, the two alleles are both lowercase b, so the genotype that we'll write in this box will be lowercase b, lowercase b. Take a few minutes to try to fill in the other two boxes for this Punnett square. Does your answer look like this? Punnett squares are very simple to use, but we need to interpret the results that we come up with. The four genotypes that we get from the Punnett squares are the possible genotypes for an offspring of these two parents. We see that for this case, there are only two different genotypes that the offspring could have, capital B, lowercase b, or lowercase b, lowercase b. The child of the parents with these genotypes would have a 50% chance of having the genotype capital B, lowercase b, and a 50% chance of having the genotype lowercase b, lowercase b. Now what does this tell us about the possibilities for the offspring's actual features? If the offspring has genotype capital B, lowercase b, they will have brown eyes because they carry one dominant allele. If the offspring has genotype lowercase b, lowercase b, they will have blue eyes because they only carry recessive alleles. Let's do another Punnett square, assuming Grandpa's genotype was homozygous instead of heterozygous. Take a few minutes to set up the Punnett square and fill in all the possible genotypes for the offspring. Does your Punnett square look like this? For this case, all four possible genotypes for the offspring are the same. What kind of phenotype will the offspring have? Since each of the genotypes have a dominant allele, the offspring has a 100% chance of having brown eyes. Let's work through another example. This time, we'll consider Joe and Cynthia, who both have a heterozygous genotype for curly hair. Note that curly hair is dominant and represented by the capital letter C. We want to know what are the possible genotypes and phenotypes for their children. Take a few minutes to work through the Punnett square and come up with your answers. Then share your results with a friend to see if your Punnett squares agree. First, you have to write the genotypes for Joe and Cynthia. They both have curly hair so we know their genotypes must have at least one capital C allele. We were told that their genotype is heterozygous, meaning that the two alleles are different. Now we know that Joe and Cynthia have the genotype capital C, lowercase c. For these parent genotypes, we can fill in the Punnett square. We get three different possible genotypes for the offspring, capital C, capital C, capital C, lowercase c, and lowercase c, lowercase c. Two of the genotypes are homozygous, and two are heterozygous like the parents. This tells us that the offspring has a 25% chance of having the genotype capital C, capital C, a 50% chance of having the genotype capital C, lowercase c, and a 25% chance of lowercase c, lowercase c.
That means that their children will have a 75% chance of having curly hair and a 25% chance of having straight hair. We don't typically hear people worrying about trying to figure out all the possibilities of hair type or eye color for their children. So where does this really serve a purpose? Why is it important to know what genes may be passed from one generation to the next? Take a few minutes to think about this question and discuss some possible reasons with your classmates. Punnett squares can help us determine the likelihood that a child will inherit a genetic disorder from their parents. Genetic disorders occur because some alleles of certain genes can cause diseases. Let's use sickle cell anemia as an example of a genetic disorder. The gene for hemoglobin can have two alleles, one that codes for normal hemoglobin and another that codes for sickle cell hemoglobin. If a person is homozygous for the sickle cell allele, then they will have the disease sickle cell anemia. Remember what homozygous means. Both alleles are the same. So in order for a person to have sickle cell anemia, both of their alleles must be for sickle cell hemoglobin. We can see the difference in shape between the sickle cells and the normal red blood cells. A person who is heterozygous for the sickle cell and normal hemoglobin alleles usually does not have symptoms of sickle cell anemia. So in this respect, they are like a person who is homozygous for the normal hemoglobin allele. This is why textbooks usually describe the sickle cell allele as recessive. However, people who are heterozygous for the sickle cell allele are not exactly like people who are homozygous for the normal hemoglobin allele. People who are heterozygous for the sickle cell allele are less likely to develop severe malaria, an infection of the red blood cells which is transmitted by mosquitoes in many tropical countries. Thus, in areas where malaria is widespread, People who are heterozygous for the sickle cell allele are less likely to become seriously ill and die. Because of this advantage, the sickle cell allele becomes relatively common in regions like West Africa, where malaria is common. Since African Americans are descended from populations in which the sickle cell allele was relatively common, African Americans have relatively high rates of the sickle cell allele. Approximately 8% are heterozygous for the allele and 0.16% are homozygous. Let's consider two people who are heterozygous for the sickle cell allele. If these people marry, what will be the possibilities for the genetic makeup of their children? Spend a few minutes to complete the Punnett square using the letter S to represent the alleles before we discuss the answers. Since the parents are heterozygous, what are their genotypes? Remember, heterozygous means two different alleles, so their genotype will be capital S, lowercase s. The resulting Punnett square should look like this. Now let's use this Punnett square to answer some questions. First, what fraction of their children will suffer from sickle cell anemia? Remember that sickle cell anemia is recessive, so what genotype will have sickle cell anemia? The one that is homozygous for the recessive allele, which is the genotype with two lowercase s's. If we look at our Punnett square, we see only one out of four of the possibilities is homozygous for the sickle cell allele, so we can expect 25%, or one out of every four children, to develop sickle cell anemia. By the same logic, two out of four predicted genotypes are heterozygous for sickle cell allele. Therefore, the fraction of children that will not develop sickle cell anemia, but will be less likely to develop malaria, is 50%, or one out of every two children. For more practice with Punnett squares, genotypes, and phenotypes, visit the website shown. You can also complete these additional activities for more practice. These activities are included as part of the lesson plan resources.